live from their home studios. Please welcome the hosts of Death Central Connects, Boo Lamb and Jason Rom. Well, hello, Dev Central community. Welcome to today's Dev Central Connects. Uh, we are coming to you live, and we should be on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and on LinkedIn. So if you have not already, you'll want to hit subscribe to this content so that you can see more of it. Really excited about the show that we're going to have on today as well. It should be uh, a really fun time. We're talking to Laura Lonzo, and she's going to be giving us her real automation story about how she went through a bit of a journey to implement automation practices in her uh, organization, in her network engineering practice. I think it'll be really cool uh, to go through that journey uh, with everyone. So um, today, uh, before we bring on Laura, actually, I'll be bringing on my guest here, or sorry, my co-host here, Mr. Jason Rom. Jason, how you doing? Woo, I'm doing good. Still not in awesome. my office yet, but I'm doing well. <laughs> Awesome. Um, listen, I've got a, I've got a trivia question for you today, actually, and I am trying to find it. Uh, if you just give me a second here, not a problem. I love trivia. I'm not always so good at it, but I love it. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so this is a, a piece of trivia that we can ask. Uh, where is it here? Okay, piece of trivia that we can ask yourself, but we can also ask our guest when she comes on as well. I'll have a second question for her. So okay. the question for you today is, who is the world's um, longest ever reigning world chess champion? Wow, the longest? Uh, Kasparov would be my first thought, but I'm going to go Magnus. <laughs> okay, well, if this is correct on this website, and I don't know, I just I Googled this earlier today. Um, it says there's a German named Dr. Emanuel Lasker retained the champion title for the most time, 26 years and 337 days. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Magnus is uh, not there yet. So. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, so having, uh, having gotten that out of the way, uh, I'm looking forward to having this chat uh, today with Laura. Uh, one thing that we want to talk about uh, first, though, is we have upcoming uh, F5 Agility. And uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more on Tuesday here, but we have a number of uh, sessions that have just been approved that are coming up, right? That's right. Yeah. The If you've registered, that list is out on the Agility website and you can start to plan. Uh, can't sign up for your, for your sessions yet, but you could definitely start penciling in which ones are your favorite on Tuesday on our top five all of us are going to go through the one that we're most looking forward to. And so, yeah, that, that really looking forward to agility. It's going to be a good time. Yeah. Awesome. I always appreciate agility. I know I took a quick scan through the session so far and a lot of stuff around modernization. And so I think a lot of people are going to have really great takeaways to implement for the coming 2022 year. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to it. All righty. So um, without further ado, I am going to uh, run a little bit of a segue here, and we will bring on our guest, Laura Alonzo, in just a moment. Laura, how are you doing today? Pretty good, Boo. How's it going, Jason? It's Very going well. So did you know the answer to the, the first trivia question? Did you know the Definitely long question? not. I was going to get Fisher or someone like that. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. my family always talks about Fisher. So they were very <laughs> impressed. My yeah, uncle okay, loves yeah. him. He can tell you about all his games and like his most famous games. It's pretty fun to talk to him about it. Yeah. yeah wow. I, I love pretty... chess. I, and and you, are a, you are a huge chess fan. You play? Yeah, I mean, yes, I play. Uh, I just finished a, a tournament this past weekend. I won two games. I lost three. Uh, it was a great experience, though. I uh, signed up for like a higher section that I'm rated for, and it was fun to see the openings and everything that those kind of players do. So That's I had cool. a great yeah. experience. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, you know, and you 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 do uh, you know backpacking and snowboarding and all that. And I I came out to Colorado and and skiing with uh, one of my old bosses, and and his big thing was, Rom, if you're not falling, you're not learning. 
And so, <laughs> you know, I think that applies to chess too. If you're not challenging yourself and, and uh, where you are going to fail, you're probably not going to, you're not going to progress to that next level. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you get a very wise boss. So I'm, yeah. 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 Boss still, if you're watching. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Laura, welcome to the show today. We are going to be talking about your real automation story, but maybe we could take a second to uh, to give you a couple minutes to introduce yourself, um, what your background is, and and uh, you know where you're at today. Yeah, yeah. So, for sure. Thank you, Boo. Um, I'm Laura Alonso. I um, I'm a network engineer for Progressive Insurance. I really enjoy my role there. Um, I well, if you go a little bit more back, if you hear an accent, it's because I'm Cuban. I've been in the United States for about 16 years. Um, I went to FIU in Miami, Florida, uh, and that's where I started my journey for network engineering. And, uh, you know, uh, then out of college, I got hired by Progressive Insurance, and it's just been a really excellent, like, uh, learning, you know, uh, opportunity and the culture here is just incredible. So I really enjoy working with my team. And other than that, uh, I enjoy my hobbies, you know, backpacking, chess, uh, Colorado. I've moved, I've been in Colorado for almost nine years and uh, uh, can't say I'm, I'm bored of it. I, I hope to stay here for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. love Colorado. Love that state. I've been there so many times skiing and had family there in Colorado Springs for a while. And uh, so love, love, love that state. It was a dream of mine to move there eventually. But, you know, as you get older, my kids are not there. And and so uh, grandbabies are in Kansas City. So that's that's probably where we're going to end up. But I'll, I'll be a long time visitor for sure. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Very cool. Um, maybe, you know, one thing I, I thought about there as you're talking through that, what got you interested in network engineering in the first place? Like you went to school specifically for that? Um, I started as a college engineering, a, a computer engineering major. And then uh, as part of the curriculum, I took a data communications class and the instructor was incredible. She talked about like the class was about uh, network protocols and transport communication transfer layered communications and that sort of things and uh, i just i was fascinated by the content and uh and so then i switched over from computer engineering to information technology with an emphasis on network uh administration nice okay yeah yeah that's uh, really cool i i i do not have a, a background in it, but that's what I went to right out of college. Right out of college, mine was in uh, avionics uh, for you know building airplanes and and uh, you know making sure they their instrumentation allows pilots to do what they need to do. Um, nice. But I Beautiful. I was in a rotation right out of uh, right out of college in an, in an internship where I got to touch a switch and a router for the first time, and and I was like, yes, this is this is what I want to do. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I took a class that was basically um, configuring and administering multiple like uh network uh equipment like we had juniper and cisco and quagga like open source stuff and um uh, yeah and it was incredible uh and then i was like oh yes i made the right decision to to pick this that's cool. So as as you got, you know, into your career at the very beginning, what were the traditional networking skills that maybe took the longest to solidify for you? Wow. So I think I'm not very good with memorization of terms. And I feel when you get into the field, there's a lot of certifications and um, you try to go that path because you feel like employers are looking for certifications to assign you to a specific role and i struggle a lot with uh the way specific things were taught like if you look at a certification it usually starts like oh this is the networking layer uh, the networking stack um and then you go through the different layers and then you have to memorize like what the layers are and what the technologies in each layer are and i struggle a lot with that um like I couldn't remember like, you know, the data link versus the network versus the transport. Like to me, that didn't, you know, I couldn't remember them. 
And I look to it now, and I think what's helped me in my career understand concepts like that, like uh, the networking uh, stack, is working in products that are specific to a layer. So like if I'm working on a layer two switch or a layer three switch, then you know the networking stack, the layer, the layer that it works. And it is easier for me to remember um, the concepts when I'm able to apply the knowledge on actual uh, network implementations rather than just memorize what uh, something specific to 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 that. Um, but yeah, I think the early memorization that the, the even though I was in college, it was just um, it just wasn't sticking for me. Yeah. 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 And I find sometimes some of the theory, it's, it's great for the people building uh, the technology. But for those of us implementing it and using it, it, it's not always that helpful. And so yeah. it's like maybe it's helpful to know that stuff, but but in often often the case, I, I didn't find it useful at all. Yeah, no, and I, and I love having the opportunity to be like hands on with specific products. Uh, I think that really helps drive the concepts home. Like it's not just listening about them; it's actually implementing them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've been in your career for a while. You know, it's not like you're just getting started. So, um, when did network automation start to pique your interest? Like, um, maybe, maybe it's like when did you first hear about it, and then when did you start maybe just thinking about, hey, maybe that's something I should start investing in. Um, so, I had a little bit of experience with network automation. Um, there was a time in my career where we had a lot of like network migrations and. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with Fabric Path, but uh, some of your viewers might be where um, we had to move networks from that environment to a different environment. In Fabric Path, you have to log into every single switch in the fabric. And if you want to delete, let's say, a segment, a VLAN, you got to log in into every single switch. And these fabrics can get pretty large. And so you're logging into like maybe eight or 10 switches to delete a VLAN every day, let's say, because that's the wow. stage of the project. And I was like, there has to be something that I could do around this. And I ended up implementing like a little expect, bash and expect script. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is, this makes my job so much easier. All I had to do is define a VLAN, run it, and then the script would log in everywhere. And then uh, once I moved to network engineering, I, uh, I had a customer, uh, OpenStack customer, and the way that they implemented the network, how they were able to just tell the customer, uh, the customer needed a development VM. They are able to spin it up and then everything gets done on the back end. And then your customers also had the opportunity to not even interact with OpenStack. All they had to do was maybe define the requirements on a Terraform uh, document, like, and then just spin up thousands of in instances, uh, to me, that was very impressionable, I want to say. And and so I was like, well, can we do that on the network side? Can we just have everything done? And then we can focus on the real network engineering tasks, which are like design and planning and integration of new technologies into the data centers. Um, and so that's really what sparked the interest on a more uh, development uh, guided approach to automation rather than being able to just uh, script little uh, changes here and there that were actually only used by me. And uh, I felt like uh, there was more benefit if everyone in the team was familiar with the network stack and how to um, implement automation and instead of having like one-off use cases, snowflakes like that. Yeah. yeah. In, in um, your experience, one, oh, go ahead, Joe Boo. Well, actually, I just wanted to bring up here, some of this is documented in a blog that you wrote here. And so the research team in the back has put a link to that blog article up there. But some of the questions that we're probably going to uh, get an answered from you today are going to be highlighted inside of this blog. So. Just wanted to, to highlight that for everyone. Nice, thanks. Go ahead. Jason. Yeah, and that's really cool that that uh, you know you write your experience, and I, I think for me that's helpful to kind of document my journey, uh, not only just to solidify those concepts for me 
but also, you know, it, it's been important as I go along, uh, the more, uh, that, that I share, uh, with others, uh, the more I learn because, you know, people come back, Hey, saw you did that. You might consider these couple of things like, Oh, that's so much easier than what I did. And yes, so, yes. you know, it's, it, yeah, it, it's fulfillment along the way. And, and other people who also like to share, invest in you, uh, passively, which is, which is kind of cool. Yeah, when I actually when I met with my team and I was like, this is something that we should definitely do. And one of the main points that I wanted to drive was collaboration. Like I really wanted our team to be able to understand what uh, um, myself and like uh, uh, other uh, teammates were putting out not only to understand what it was doing, but to give them the ability to write it, them write the scripts or playbooks or whatever tools themselves or improve on existing on existing um, automation products yeah so it was it was a it's a big part of our um, drive our work right now to be able to come together and collaborate yeah that's great do you find in in your organization that uh, most of your fellow network engineers are you know, excited to jump on board? Is there a little bit of hesitancy? Uh, because maybe they feel a little bit like, well, if I automate my job, then um, I won't have a job? Uh, or is everybody just kind of all on board? Hey, let's do this. I get the feeling that everyone is on board. Um, I don't get that hesitancy of about uh, automate, getting automated out of a job. There's, I mean, in my organization, we just have so much work that being able to automate the implementation part of it, the testing on implementation, it, it's just going to make our lives easier. Because um, implementation today, I would say probably takes like over 50% of our time. And what we should, I, in my opinion, what we should be focusing on is what I mentioned earlier about the actual design, research, and planning of implementing new technologies or existing technologies, you know, integrating, you know, if the storage team comes up to me and says, oh, we have this new storage solution, uh, I need to spend time, you know, with them to make sure that the, so the design and connectivity that we provide to them meet the standards, you know, high availability, redundancy, and that sort of thing that are compatible with the new product instead of, you know, uh, spending, then doing all that planning and then spending just as long trying to actually put it in place when that could be automated and do it a little, a lot quicker. Yeah, for sure. Um, I had a question. So, you you know, you had been automating little bits and pieces yourselves, and then we kind of get to, um, you know, what you've wrote about in your blog here, how you actually got to John Capobianco's book and started reading that. It, you know, you, you note that you read that in three days, which is pretty amazing. I don't I don't know if I've ever read a book, any book in three days. Um, but, you know, is it how did you get to the point where you, you started to do some stuff and then it's it looked like in this blog article, then you got to the point where you wanted to do a lot of stuff and really, you know, um, take the bull by the horns there, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, my learning has been very, is like that compound interest. Like you learn a little bit every year, I would say, and, and then everything starts clicking. So when I read John's book, actually, it just g gave me, you know, what I was missing was the blueprint. Um, I wanted a. I, I wanted to understand how everything could fit in, in a way that we can standardize across multiple implementations, multiple features of automation. And John's book was really good at giving me a blueprint of what a repository could look like, and then explaining what, um, let's say, uh, the YAML files that you store on the host bars folder you could apply those YAML files to specific devices and configure them based on what you've, uh, what you've, uh, what you've written down there. And so um, I just, uh, I knew a little bit, uh, well, I knew some Python, I knew 
uh, some Ansible and his book was just able to explain the, the different Ansible components for me to bring everything together. And the nice thing about his book is that he doesn't just do theory. He tells you a little bit of theory and then he gives you an implementation example. So it's really easy for you to visualize what you just read. And I, I just found that very, very um, useful. And so, um, yeah, and so then once I had that blueprint, I was just able to start putting it into place pretty pretty straightforward. Luckily, I had a little bit of experience attending some like DevNet and other vendor workshops. So I knew that they supported like Ansible. And so they had like uh, libraries to interact with their platforms. And so after uh john talked about he talks in his book about ios and nxos libraries um i was really it was really easy to uh bring in other types of libraries into into the implementation like you know for aci or vmware something like that yeah so well, it was really easy to transpose that knowledge to other not just what he talks about in the book yeah well john's actually here he's in, he's in the crowd he, he has a question for you it's like, would you say the challenges with organizational culture or the specific technologies network en engineers need to learn? Um, also, uh, comment. Thank you for sharing your journey. Um, thanks, John. I appreciate that question. So, um, I think for me, I think uh, actually, uh, I was just talking to a, a colleague, a friend of mine, about this. How I felt like maybe last year was probably the first. It was the perfect timing for our team to start this automation journey because everything at the corporate and organization level lined up. If I would have wanted to do this four and five years ago when uh, GitHub uh, was, we didn't have a local GitHub repository, um, uh, maybe TFS was only for developers instead of the infrastructure teams, even uh, OpenStack has really enabled. <clears throat> development across multiple organizations in our team because you, you're just able to request a project and in five minutes you could have an instance or multiple instances spin up you don't have to wait weeks for a vm to be spin up and the os to be provisioned and different settings so that really sped up that entire process i think all the tools that uh culturally sp speaking the uh, my organization opened up to all the tools available to the developers. And so um, I think if the organization does, does not uh, value automation and does not value uh, or does not prioritize uh, having the automation tools available to their engineers, then that's going to cause you know, problems and it, it's, it's, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like, basically, um, if I want to automate something and I don't have the tools to automate it, um, I'm probably going to be disappointed with, with that. And, you know, I'm going to not want to be happy in my job if I, if I don't have the tools to do my job or to uh, plan or attain the goals that I have. So, um, uh, I think my organization has been going through a change in the past four years since we started m integrating with public cloud and that sort of um, technology st stacks. A lot of the engineers that did that do public cloud for uh, my company, uh, they brought up some of those practices into the internal company, and it's just been incredible to to be able to use their learnings. Yeah, I, I think it's great that organizations are opening up to, you know, a lot more tools, especially all these tools that are open source and you, you don't really have to pay for them and, and all that. And that's great. But I, I know that there's some healthy tension there too, because, you know, as more and more tools are brought into the organization, uh, you know, you have all these supply chain attacks that are happening. It's like, oh, I'm going to use this tool. And maybe sometimes there's like, hey, I, I've got this tool. I'm going to throw it in my environment. But but maybe it should be vetted a little bit and all that. So I think there's mm -hmm. some healthy tension there. But I'm glad that overall organizations are opening up to that. Yeah, I think security is a huge is, is a huge part of that of that thought process. And, and it wasn't until I think uh, the security teams were on board 
with the process to vet and review these products that the organization didn't make that full transition. Because I think security, yeah. and it should be, it should be prioritized uh, on top of all these um, the new products and fast pace that we're going. Uh, security should be top of mind. And it was great to to see the progress that we could make once they were fully on board with the automation journey for the entire company, not just uh, the infrastructure organization. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Um, so we got a couple minutes left here. Maybe we can end off with asking you, you know, now that you've done all this uh, in the past year, what are your plans for 2022? Um, you know, is there more accomplishments that you want to get to with uh, when it comes to automation? Yeah, definitely. So I think, uh, I think I want to go off on like uh, John's final chapter of his book where he starts talking about CICD. Uh, that is the dream, right? Uh, to have a fully automated um, network deployment where the customer requests an environment and it's pretty quick for, for us to provision it via automation. And so, yeah, the plan is to have a fully automated uh, CICD pipeline for let's say new virtual environments uh, in the data center. So that's the goal for this year and you know learning the tools to make sure that that can be done. But at the same time, I think the biggest obstacle for me is the testing aspect of CICD, right? You just don't wanna just implement something. You wanna make sure that it's gonna work and it's not gonna cause an outage, uh, right? That, that's one of the big things that he talks in the book. You never wanna do harm to the book, uh, to, I'm sorry, to the network. Uh, so yeah, uh, CICD is the goal for this year. That's awesome. Well, well, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, later this year or beginning of next year, uh, we can have you back, uh, and you can talk about, um, you know, how successful that, that journey, uh, that next peak, um, journey it is any, any final thoughts for, uh, maybe other network engineers out there that haven't begun their automation journey or, or maybe they started, but they've had so many obstacles that they just, they feel like they're stuck on first base. Oh yeah. Um, I think, um, my recommendation, and I, I told this to my team, is to start small. Uh, don't try to automate an entire switch, for example. Try to uh, start with something small, like NTP servers on a switch. Start with that. How, and that will teach you the methods to SSH, to automatically to the, an appliance, authenticate, and then make the configuration change and see the results. And just start with something small. And then... Um, try to talk to your management. Maybe sometimes of some, some of the obstacles that they're seeing is because they're not getting the support from the organization. And I think a lot of open, uh, a lot of doors open once the organization is on the same page about that. Yeah. So you're saying communicating with your, your leadership is a good thing. <laughs> yes. You know, at the end of the day, they're the ones who will put up the money to, uh, make sure that your, 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 the tools are available and they're the ones who will talk to other teams and bring them in into that. Like it's, it's not you against the wall. You, you know what is the saying says it takes a village. So, and that's exactly what the automation journey should be. It shouldn't be a one man, a woman uh, yeah. job. There you go. We got a comment here from Boris, uh, Nick Russo's contributions, highly recommended for the CICD aspects of the network automation. Thank you, Boris, for sharing that. Yeah, I have to check out his uh, documentation and his plural site uh, courses. They are pretty cool. Um, I, I've started a couple of them so far, so it looks good. Thanks for the recommendation. Good deal. Very cool. Um, I, my comments are a little bit lag, Jason. Anything else in the comments for Laura? Or is that the last one? Uh, just the, John uh, commented back after your answer. Very thoughtful answer. Thank you. Ah, so. Anytime. John, thanks for for joining the crowd. Always always glad to have you here. Um, yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing your journey uh, with us today, Laura. Um, all of your links for your Twitter and your LinkedIn are inside of the comments, uh, and we've popped them up as banners as well. So, and we'll put them into the description of the various uh, socials so that people can find you. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today. No, thank you, Boo and Jason and John and everyone on the team. I appreciate it. Uh, it's been uh, great talking to you. 
Great. Appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Well, that was super fun, Jason. It was really interesting to learn uh, about the journey because it seems like automation is a journey. It's just not kind of like just show up and start automating everything and then you're done, right? It is, yeah. And I, I, I love people stories uh, because ultimately it, it's it's all of us people that make this stuff happen. And so, uh, you know, whether you're stuck or you just like to cheer people on, as they're going on their journey, it, it's nice to see what other people are going through, what they've gone through, what they still have to go through, uh, because that uh, that breeds confidence for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? It's people sharing their stories as well. And so Laura sharing her story and then Laura, you know, learns from other people like John Capobianco as well. So we have this web of uh, learning and this web of people that uh, that make all this stuff happen. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And, you know, as a shout out to John, he's been on fire lately with mind maps and he's mind mapping everything. I think he's mind mapped Star Wars canon uh, recently, <laughs> or I, I think that was that was one of them. But he's he's mind mapping everything. And it's 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 pretty awesome. So you'll have to go out and yeah. check out uh, John's stuff because he's uh, his contributions are incredible. And uh, and even if you don't care about the canon of Star Wars, uh, finding out how he's using uh, turning APIs into mind maps and, and all that uh, will be a, a boon to your own skill set. Yeah, absolutely. I saw one the other day who was mind mapping uh, historical baseball stats, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Yep. Um, so we've got a couple things to note just as we close off here. Well, actually, first thing um, is F5 Agility 2022. And so next week on the top five, we're going to be going over. So the, the sessions were just kind of made public today. So we're actually going to go over them as a team. And then we're going to pick out our top five and, and mention them to folks. And hopefully that helps you pick out some of the sessions because there's a lot to go through on there. Um, after that, we have on, on the 27th, another Dev Central Connects. This is going to be the OWASP Top 10 with John Wagnonicon. Um, <laughs> we'll be on there. So that'll be a, a good show. That'll be cool. Well. Yeah. If you've, if you've watched his, uh, Lightboard, uh, lessons on the OWASP Top 10, wildly popular. We've had like university after university over the years, uh, asking us, Hey, can we use these in our courses and all that? So it's been a wildly popular series. I know he's uh, been updating it as well for the new, the new top 10. And so that'll, that'll be a great conversation. Yeah. Very cool. Looking forward to that one. And then otherwise look for the, uh, February schedule pretty soon here, uh, for the dev central lineup. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, Laura, for joining us today. Thank you, John Capobianco, for being in the comments and, and adding in some context as well. Um, and then otherwise, we will leave you with a little bit of a, a, a hint of the next show from Peter Silva. Otherwise, see you later, folks. Hey, have you registered for F5's Agility yet? It's our annual customer, partner, and user conference. If not... Head on over to f5.com forward slash agility and check it out. And then join the Dev Central team Tuesday, January 25th, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, as we help you build out your agenda. It's time for top five again, and we'll be counting down our top five F5 agility sessions. So join us January 25th, 9.30 a.m. for the live stream. We'll see you then.